This paper is by way of an introduction to one aspect, board and dice games, of the history and archaeology of leisure and recreation in primarily medieval Scotland and set within a wider European, indeed global, context. Leisure time, to varying degrees, is an element of culture shared by all levels of society, however stratified. That said, the socially disadvantaged frequently have less leisure time available to them. They certainly have less wealth for the acquisition of recreational material culture, and so make a more opaque showing in the archaeological record. Leisure is the free time, or the time not devoted to one's occupation and survival needs, at the disposal of an individual or group of people, and so can be deemed to be a measure of the strictures on time applied within a given society. An alternative name uh, <coughs> for, the, for leisure is recreation, which indicates the pursuit of a pleasurable activity, or the process of an, of an individual's entertainment and relaxation. The linguistic root of this word is the same as recreate, which in its modern form is spelled the same with the addition of a hyphen. This is significant because it imbues uh, recreation with one of its key meanings, that of repetition, a reuse of or refashioning of reality through the pursuit of one's pleasurable desires. It carries then the sense of recreating the world through the reordering of reality in terms of the present study on the gaming board or through the roll of the dice. Of course, reality is not always pretty, and many of these games and or elements of their equipment have been used as weapons in acts of murderous violence. The other key word to which board and dice games are subordinate is play. Play is primarily a free activity bounded by its own space and time where it can unfold its own inner order. An older view of play argued that it prefigured culture and civilization as the archetypal opposite of that which is rational, controlled, and systematized. It is a view that remains useful in some of its detail, but has been for many superseded by a more functional approach which sees forms of play as embedded and interwoven with social structures. It thus has a greater concern with particular forms of play and their social contexts. Board and dice games, for example, are clear examples of play forms with cultural and cross-cultural contexts. Leisure, or play of course, covers much more than gaming, and in the context of medieval society, it includes hunting pursuits and horse racing, and those seasonal and ephemeral pursuits where the natural world is reshaped, as with the snowballing scenes shown here. A 14th century poem by Jean Froissart lists 51 medieval games, and describes how children modified common materials to create ephemeral objects for their play. They modelled mud, wood, cloth, chow, and even bread, to construct mills, ovens, weapons, hobby horses, and boats. This presentation will deal with board games, but before turning to the Scottish evidence, we'll go on a brief, a brief, brief look at some Chinese parallels, particularly from Tang Dynasty China, a period conventionally dated to AD 618 to 906, and so contemporary with our pits. Uh, top left is a Tang Dynasty horse and rider pottery figurine, the rider may be a male merchant with his pack, but is just as likely to be a woman dressed as a man. This was a fashionable practice during the Tang Dynasty, when women had greater freedom to mix socially uh, more than at any other time in Chinese history. At the same time, polo was very popular and was played by the women of the palace. The Emperor Zhong Zhong was noted as a skilled player and his palace included a polo field something that was also part of the royal palace in Constantinople by the 11th century. In 799, Han Yu wrote a tract against the playing of polo, seeking to persuade his superior, Zhang Jiangfeng, uh, to give it up. One strand of his argument was that horses should be kept for fighting off rebel attacks and not for play. Zhang countered that polo enhanced his performance as a military governor, and other governors insisted it was good military training. There are echoes here of the Roman argument about dice and games being important for the art of war and for learning strategy. Staying a moment longer with the Tang Dynasty, this slide also shows a gilt silver tea set jar from a Buddhist temple and includes as one of its cartouche scenes 
two old men playing Chinese chess. There are four scenes in all, each of religious significance and able to bear Taoist, Confucian or Buddhist interpretations. The modern version of Chinese chess was developed in the late Tang Dynasty, but was probably played sometime before that. The aim was to checkmate your opponent's king, suggesting a common origin with European chess, either in India or China. The depiction of this cartouche is similar to many late Ming Dynasty scenes of the Han Dynasty, <coughs> by woodcutter Wang Ji, who stumbles on two Taoist immortals playing the game. This Chinese excursion has given us an instructive parallel picture that we can hold in our minds as we now turn to Pickland. Two points to note in particular are that gaming is an ideal medium for metaphor and in its deployment in art, or indeed in the minds of players and onlookers, is usefully ambiguous and malleable. Secondly, games as modes of expression can be projected, be projected back into the past. The two earliest written references to the picks are by anonymous Roman writers, one in 297 AD, and often mistakenly referred to as Eumenius, and one in 310 AD, both seemingly written in the context of the British victories of Constantius Chlorus. Constantius' son, Constantine, assumed the purple in York in 306 AD at his father's deathbed. His taking the title Britannicus Maximus in 314 is likely to signify further campaigning against the Picts. This has received interpretive corroboration from excavation at the Roman villa sites of Wettweiss Freudsheim in Germany in the early 1980s. The finds included a copper alloy dice tower with open work geometric sides and a set of interior baffles that direct dice dropped into the tower onto its flight of steps, flanked by a pair of dolphins. It bears two inscriptions, one one around the upper edge of the sides and the back, uh, reading uh, Uteri Felix Vivas, use happily, may you live, a form of good luck message appropriate to the playing of a board game. The second inscription fills the front panel, a descending sequence of six words, Pictos Victos Hostis Delita Ludai Securi, which translates as the Picts defeated, the enemy wiped out, playing without fear. This hexagram is typical of similar inscriptions on Roman game boards, including from Rome and Trier, generally accepted as being for the games of uh, Twelve Scripta and Alia, or Tables, the Roman progenitors of backgammon. The style of the inscriptions links boards and dice tower to the same type of game. The inscription on the Freudsheim dice tower could be a reference to the Valentinian campaign of Theodosius against the Picts in AD 368-369, or equally may be a reference to the Constantin Constantinian campaigns of the early 4th century. Further confirmation of campaigning against the Picts at the end of the 3rd century is suggested by an earlier board from Trier and one from the catacomb of Saints Marco and Marcellino in Rome. Both boards have been dated to 297 AD and both are inscribed, one referring to victories against the Parthians and the other against the Britons. There seems to be some conflict here between Eumenius referring to the Picts as the enemies of the Britons, by then the friends of Rome presumably, and these gaming boards referring to the Britons as being defeated by Rome. Did the military see the terms Britain and Pict as interchangeable or overlapping? Or do we read these boards as a very specific reference to the Britons of the usurper Emperor Electus, whom Constantius defeated in 296 AD. We need also to bear in mind the caution sounded by Martin Hennig that Pict, and what we can extend this to, Britain and Parthian, was a topos, and so difficult to tie to a particular date. Returning to Britain, the evidence for Roman gaming is prolific, not only from military sites, uh, this is some of the material from Corbridge, uh, and uh, if you remember that board for, for later, but also from non-military sites. Uh, one of the most significant of these is the so-called Doctor's Grave from Colchester. This grave was part of a burial complex at Stanway on the outskirts of Colchester in Essex. The site history extends from the 2nd or 3rd century BC to the 60s AD. The incumbent of the Doctor's Grave appears to have been a Briton buried in the 50s AD. 
The grave finds include pottery, rings, medical instruments, some rods, which were suggested to be for divination, and a gaming board with plain pieces laid upon it, which may have been ceremoniously deposited, something like this. The board has been reconstructed tentatively as a game of Ludus the Trunculorum, or a Celtic variant thereof, which used to be translated as the game of little soldiers, but is now generally accepted as the game of little robbers, the robbers being mercenary soldiers. The game does not involve dice, but a board on which two opposing players move alternately to try and take their opponent's piece. The Colchester layout may be for a conventional opening of the game, or it may reflect any divinatory role the game had when deployed by a doctor or a druid. Colchester may seem a long way from Pickland, but links between the two places are evidence at a slightly later date when Colchester attracted at least one Pictish visitor. His name was Lucio Vader, and on an inscribed plaque from Colchester, he styled himself as a Caledonian, the grandson of Wapigenus, a name that implies a chief of the Venicones, which is now five. Anthony Burley has suggested that Vida may well have been a merchant, possibly a slave trader, a Roman employed mercenary, or a noble hostage. I'm not suggesting that the Colchester doctor was a Pict, but simply trying to demonstrate the fluidity of cultural exchange between Romans and British communities. Gaming deserves to be regarded as an important avenue and example of such cultural exchange. There are a small number of rich British, Romano British burials from southern Britain, notably Colchester, St Albans and Wellin in Hertfordshire, which included sets of gaming pieces. The rarity of such burials is taken as a sign of their social exclusivity. There are indications of a similar inclusion of game material in some elite burials in Pickland, perhaps the best example of which is that from Walkmill near Tarland in Aberdeenshire, the former site of a stone circle where a kiss burial was found in 1898. The finds included seven brownish quartzite counters, four dark blue glass counters and two very coloured counters. The style of these pieces makes them typical Roman gaming counters. Unfortunately, the precise details of the context were not recorded, their finding being accidental. We know they were associated with a burial and that the other finds included a miniature bronze cauldron. The group is dated broadly to the first half of the first millennium AD. There seems no doubt that the incumbent was a Pict, one that was a consumer of Roman material culture. Tarland is the most coherent and substantial group of Roman counters from non-Roman contexts in Scotland. Uh, just this week, in fact, I've had some hot off the press news from, from Richard Bradley, who led an excavation at Tarland Stone Circle last September, and on the perimeter of the circle found two further graves. One was stone lined and contained another set of gaming pieces, ten pebbles and a shale counter, plus a penannual brooch very similar to the one found over a hundred years ago. The other grave had an oak plank along its base, which was probably all that survived of a coffin. There are several other pieces uh, known from various sites in Scotland, including Trapperin Law, uh, Camlon, and Buckleavy, all of them demonstrative of contact with Rome. On the presently available evidence, the idea that board games were an innovation stemming from contact with Rome has a lot going for it. Even the most clearly non-Roman elements of the gaming assemblage from Scotland, the parallelopipe dice, stone balls, and various sized stone discs, have complexities of function and chronology which make their meaning opaque. Stone discs are a ubiquitous group that occur widely on sites from at least the late Bronze Age through to the post-medieval period. Their general uniformity of shape has tended to obscure their diverse and multifunctional uses, rubbers and burnishes, pot lids and stands, and unfinished spindle worlds included. A very small number are incised with Picti symbols, and I will return to these later. Stone balls are a rather enigmatic group. Many have been found, but the majority have poor contextual information. Most of them come from sites, mostly hill forts in the southeast of Scotland, with a date range extending from the mid first millennium BC to the mid first millennium AD. They comprise various incised plain balls or marbles of stone and clay that have evaded certainty of explanation, but which are generally interpreted as gaming pieces. Even more enigmatic is the bronze ball from Walston uh, in Lanarkshire. This small ball is decorated with tripartite coils, 
some ending in birds heads, some in knobs, and which Robert Stevenson suggested could be 7th century AD in date. I note in passing that the Irish tale cycle, the Tain Boon Cullen, makes reference to hurly balls of both bronze and silver, though these have been regarded as fantastical. The third element, parallelopipe dice, uh, are rectangular or elongated cuboid dice numbered on their four long faces only. Apart from one dice that may date to the first century BC, these are generally thought to date from the second quarter of the first millennium AD. However, the greater number of such dice are from unstratified contexts. This dating scheme has not been radically changed by the excavation of Scalloway Brock uh, during uh, the late 1980s. Here, four such dice were recovered and dated to the end of phase two, which ran from 100 BC to AD 500. The distribution of these dice in Scotland is with the exception of two from Caithness, confined to the Western and Northern Isles. It can be tempting to see this as a cultural indicator, but it may equally be an indication of the availability of raw materials with mainland dyes predominantly made of wood and so less likely to survive in the archaeological record. We can probably accept these three elements, dice, discs and balls, as the closest thing we have to indigenous gaming equipment, but they are not unique to Scotland. Present, present evidence does not indicate the existence of any indigenous gaming boards, either from indigenous or Roman sites. Were they in use, we might expect them to turn up on Roman as well as on indigenous sites. Cultural interaction is, after all, a two-way street, and the Romans were great assimilators, not just of other people's deities. Uh, recent excavations of the 4th century Roman fort at Abu Shah in Egypt revealed 20 gaming boards and a dedicated gaming room. The games evidenced are typically Roman and seen elsewhere in the empire. But half the boards at Abu Shah are for the game Mankala, which is an African game that may have originated in pre-dynastic Egypt. It was clearly adopted by the Roman garrison, though this may be because it included Egyptian or African troops. The label Roman then can be ethnically obscuring if another example of assimilation, and warns us against the simplistic application of the term Roman as a mark of identity. A lack of gaming boards in pre-Roman North Europe received some uh, admittedly cautious support from Tacitus and his account of the Germans, whose gaming he describes thus. They play at dice, surprisingly enough, when they are sober, making a serious business of it, and they are so reckless in their anxiety to win however often they lose, that when everything else is gone, they will stake their personal liberty on a last de decisive throw. A loser willingly discharges his debt by becoming a slave. Even though he may be the younger and stronger man, he allows himself to be bound and sold by the winner. Such is their stubborn persistence in a vicious practice, though they call it honour. Slaves of this description are disposed of by way of trade, since even their owners want to escape the shame of such a victory. It seems reasonably clear now that the Roman expansion in Europe was accompanied by the spread of board games, a theme that Catherine Forsyth and I have recently explored in detail in a paper in Antiquity. On the continent, Roman introduced kit including three, six and nine men's Morris, found as its size boards, in addition to the same range of material as from Britain namely the kinds of counters we've been discussing. And here is a recently excavated grave of the so-called uh, Isoish Prince uh, near Copenhagen, which Alex Wolfe kindly drew to my attention. And also there are more conventional uh, cuboid dice and boards for the games Latrunculi, 12 Scripta, uh, and we have a board for that from Holt in Wales, and later the game Tabula. I do not know of any 12 scripter boards from Scotland, but there are at least two for the Trunculi, both of stone, a second century example from the fort at Bearsden on the Antonine Wall, and a mid second century example from the fort in Baraman. 12 scripter was a race game for two players around a board of three rows or 12 lines, later joined by a variation known as Alia, which deployed two rows instead of three, but with the moves still controlled by dice or knuckle bones, 
which was certainly being widely played by the time of the Emperor Claudius, of whose addiction to the game, uh, as Suetonius writes, he published a book on the subject and used to play while out driving on a special board fitted to his carriage which prevented the game from upsetting. And that's presumably a reference to a pegged board, a few of which we'll see later. As a term, uh, alia initially meant uh, lots in general, either dice or knuckle bones, but later came to mean the game described above the early version of Backham. By four, the 4th century, the name in wide currency had changed to tabula, which simply means board or plank, and perhaps indicates the prevalence of wooden boards a contrast with the surviving archaeological evidence, which in the main is of stone boards. The Latin name developed a wide currency and was adopted into several languages, including Spanish, Italian, Greek, German, Swedish, Anglo-Saxon and Welsh. These are all plural versions of the name. The game was also called, uh, was so called because tabula referred to the separate quarters of the board. Uh, the boards as a whole came to take the form of two separate halves hinged together. Tabulae also came to refer to the playing pieces or tables made. This discussion of nomenclature is useful because it brings into play one of the diff difficulties of the evidence, the often non-specific naming of board games, the giving of new names to old games and the maintaining of old names for new games. The Tafel group in Britain and Scandinavia, for example, includes the variant Nefertafel or King's Table. This is not the application of the generic tabular name to a backgammon variant, but a game that is in fact more like the Trunculi, in that the pieces move in the same way and capture by sandwiching an opponent's piece between two of your own men. In Nefertafel, a king piece and his defenders occupy the centre of the board whilst the attacking and numerically superior force occupies the edges. To win, the king must reach one of the four safe corner squares. The attacker seeks to neutralise the king by surrounding him on four sides. In the Gaelic world of Ireland and Darvita, there is uncertainty about what the game was called. The names Fifkel and Brandud are used in a number of sources, but in a rather, again, vague way. Fifkel simply means wood sets and it feels like an equivalent to tables, just meaning wooden board. Uh, both signify no more than that wooden board. Brandog means black raven, which could possibly be a reference to a key piece in the game. In later medieval texts, Fifth Girl gets translated as chess, a new game with an old name. From Ireland, we have the most spectacular surviving example of a Fnefertafel board from the Cranog side of Ballanderi, and dating to the 10th century. The marking out of the important squares suggests that Epitaphel is the game. The board is made of yew wood and the holes of the pegged pieces, uh, giving them greater stability either on land, uh, remember Claudius's coach, or at sea, which was of course the communication superhighway of the insular world. The old Irish poem, Skella Cano Macartnan, Tells of King Cano and the people of Skye's departure for Ireland in 668, and talks of a royal retinue sailing in cutters, complete with 50 well armed warriors, 50 well dressed ladies, and 50 liveried gillies, each with a silver lead of two greyhounds in his right hand, a musical instrument in his left, and the board of a fifth cal game on his back, along with the gold and silver playing men. From Pickland, we have, dating to the 8th and 9th century, several far less elaborate incised and graffiti examples of such boards, including those from Bursay, Howe, and uh, Bukui on Orkney, and similar from Pictish levels at Jarlshof and Shetland. Uh, from Dalrieta, we have this example from Dun uh, with uh, which, is, which is now in Kilmartin Museum, sorry, the reconstruction is in Kilmartin Museum. And again, uh, another example from, from Orkney. <coughs> the uh, Dunchonolai example was found as uh, a surface find at the, at the hill fort of Dunchonolai. And Anna Ritchie assessed this class of board as one strand of material culture that was shared across the insular world of the Picts, the Scots, and the Irish, and demonstrative of direct links between these three kingdoms. But the game was also shared with the Scandinavian world. 
The 10th century had, had been a Norse example from Bell and Derry, has already been mentioned. The late 9th, 10th century boat burial from Scar on Sandy in Orkney did not include a board, but did include 22 lathe turned whalebone pieces of hemispherical form with flat bases, including an obvious king piece. The game of Nefertafel is traditionally ascribed a Scandinavian origin with the earliest evidence a 5th century AD board fragment from a grave at uh, Funen in, in Denmark. But we have indicated um, <coughs> the nomenclature problem above, and some of the Pictish evidence does appear to be of a pre-Viking date. The evidence is not confined to boards. There are also examples of pegged pieces that may best be seen as uh, Hnefetafel type pieces. This is a bone example uh, from the uh, Pictish hill fort at Clashaw Craig in Fife. It's a, a hollow long bone perforated for a pin, which was also a bone, and just a fragment of it remains. Similar examples are known from the Brocks of Burian and Bursi, and we see some of those on the same slide, and also from Buston Cranagh uh, in Ayrshire and from Corbridge in Northumberland. Formerly, these were identified as pinheads, but may be better identified as pegged gaming pieces along with the globular, flat based <coughs> so called pinheads of shale. From various sites, including Trapper in Law, where there are at least 14, the Mutt of Mark, Bercy, and Hill of Cricky in Aberdeenshire. These, uh, w w there were 13 at Cricky, found as part of a hoard of bronze objects uh, under a large stone near the hill fort of Bruce's camp, probably dating to the 2nd to the 5th century. Also worthy of note are two wooden domed pieces from the Clanog, sorry, from the Clanog of Loch Glashen in Argyll. Both are highly polished to bring out the decorative effects of the grain. One bears cut marks and appears to be unfin unfinished, indicative of on-site manufacture. This might account for their lack of pegs or peg sockets, though they do not have to have been pegged pieces. The most recent excavation of a domed peg piece is that from the newly discovered surf project Brock site at Castle Craig near Orto In 2010, this uh, exciting piece I think it's exciting, <coughs> was found as part of the floor layer of the brock, along with a brooch, a copper finger ring, a shard of samian, a tankard handle, and some later material. From the same layer, there was evidence of burning, and the initial interpretation is that these were part of the contents of the brock when it was destroyed. It is made of bone and has the unique feature uh, of, of small copper alloy studs projecting from the apex and the cardinal points around the sides. Uh, the socket for the pin or peg is visible on the underside. Suggests that that's probably a, a, a king piece. Also found were a small plano convex gaming piece and a small white stone that may have also been a gaming piece. Towards the end of our period, the range of shapes for peg pieces had evolved to include pieces such as this which was found in Perth. There are variations in the, sh in the shape, but all are comfortably described by the term piriform and frequently made of bone or antler and notably common in Scandinavia between the 9th and 13th centuries. This particular example comes from Perth, uh, an unstratified find made during the horse cross excavations of 2003. Given that Perth appears to have been thriving by the early 11th century, this piece could be early medieval. Equally, it may have been lost as late as the 13th century. This is not improbable, given the Scandinavian presence in Perth in 1266. It was then that the Treaty of Perth was sealed, by which the King of Norway ceded the Hebrides to the King of Scotland. The Norwegian party included two bishops, several noblemen, the son of the Norwegian King's Chancellor, and their retinue. This piece then is a useful reminder of the fluidity and artificiality of cultural and period boundaries. There are also a number of elusive or ambiguous non pegged pieces that may be associated with Nefertafel or Fithgull, or to use its British name, which you won't find me doing very often because it's really difficult, uh, a Wistbull or, or, or something very similar to that. <laughs> if Kate were here, she'd put me right. Here's two of them. Stratigraphically, the piece from Nip dates to the first century AD. But this seems a rather impossible date, as it is identical to 
12th to 14th century chess pieces in wood and bone, especially from Novgorod. The most notable of the ambiguous pieces comes from the Brockside of Scalloway and Mail in Shetland. Splendid fellows. <clears throat> They're both of stone, and their form and style suggest they would make ideal uh, king pieces for Snefferteffel type game. Because of the early and pre Viking date, i.e., 6th century, of these pieces, uh, <clears throat> the excavators have been reluctant to accept a tapel identification. Uh, there is now a third piece in the Ashmolean Museum, which has been recently uh, uh, communicated to me by Susan Youngs, uh, and which I've christened, christened Ashmol. Uh, but alas, he's got no context, and so he doesn't help with the dating at all. Plain conical pieces are known from elsewhere, including Roman Spain. An extensive assemblage of Roman gaming equipment from Barcelona includes a conical pottery piece of similar size and shape to the Scalloway pieces, along with a cylindrical bone piece with a small uh, knob on the top dated to the 1st to the 4th century AD. Let us push our explanation further by looking at the evidence from Anglo-Saxon England. One of the commonest forms of pre-8th century gaming evidence is sets of counters, usually of bone, from several inhumation and cremation cemeteries. Their range encompasses Kent to Northumbria. The counters are invariably plano convex in form, sometimes bearing dots or similar markings on their upper surface. There are substantial numbers of them in total, but usually there are a small proportion of the finds from any one cemetery site. At Spong Hill in Norfolk, for example, counters come from less than 50 of the 1,000 burial urns. Where it is possible to tell, generally they are associated with male burials, though occasionally, but nothing like a complete set, with female burials. Such pieces, along with other types of occasional reused Roman pieces, were fully considered by Susan Youngs in her contribution to the Sutton Hoo final excavation report. She observed that the counters were unlike Roman bow counters, and so probably not influenced by Roman models. That said, even within Roman models, particularly glass and bow counters, there is a marked difference, so I think there's, there's room for manoeuvre there. Across the Roman and Anglo-Saxon series, there is a similarity of size, and the surviving sets or near sets are similarly proportioned. Young's does find other correlations with Roman gaming. In the Saxon homeland, a richly finished Germanic grave of around 300 AD from the owners in Saxony includes black and white glass counters found on a double sided board. The two games marked out were 12 Scripta and Latrunculi. Of four fragments of 5th century boards from Denmark, Three are for tabula, and the fourth is matrunculi. So again, it supports the idea of a Roman introduction of board games across Europe, and also that the migrating Anglo-Saxons, when they came to uh, uh, Britain's shores, brought with them Roman-derived board games. And of course, when they got here, they would have, would have found similar games being used, and, uh, and also different variations, probably. The Royal Bangle at Sutton Hoo included at least five ivory, flat-based, conical-topped, cylindrical gaming pieces, unlike others from Anglo-Saxon contexts. Uh, indeed, Young's notes that the closest parallels are Mediterranean or late antiquity examples, including 15 ivory and 15 ebony pieces with a 12 script board and five dice and a dice tower from a rich burial in North Africa, four examples from a 7th century Lombardic grave in Kividali in Italy, and an undated example from Carthage. The Sutton Hoo pieces are then consistent with both the Trunculi and the Tafel group. That said, in an Anglo-Saxon context, Snefertafel, as far as surviving literary references indicate, is rather opaque until the 10th century and later. Certainly by that time, it had attracted the interest of the church and clearly carried sophisticated connotations. This slide shows a page from a Corpus Christi College manuscript, an 11th century copy of a 10th century Irish gospel book. It shows the layout for Nefertapel in the form of an allegory on the harmony of the gospels, known as Alia Evangeli, the game of the gospels, or the game of the evangelists. Its title caption notes that the game was brought to Ireland by Dubinci, Bishop of Bangor, who died in 953, from the court of King Athelstan, who reigned from 925 to 940. It argues for a degree of intellectual sophistication around Nefertafel 
and its adoption into Christian ecclesiastical learning. It also supports a degree of cross-cultural Hiberno-Saxon understanding and enjoyment of board games. It's also true that it, it completely fails as a board game, it doesn't work at all. You try and play it and uh, within minutes you're, you, you, you are tearing your hair out. It might work as a, as a, as a, a preaching aid on the harmony of the Gospels, but uh, it, it's not a board game. <laughs> The most recent finds of Nefertapel boards from Scotland support the Christianising of the game. They were found by excavation at the ecclesiastical site of Inchmarnock uh, of Butte. In total, 35 incised gaming boards were found, along with a number of other slates bearing graffiti designs, inscriptions and lettering, clear indications of a monastic school function. The majority of the gaming boards appear to be for Nefertapel and are pre-12th century. So there is at least one Nine Men's Morris board and uh, an Alkirk board, both suggestive of a 12th century or later date, and which fit in with the later inscribed slates, including a 15th century example. They suggest a school function persisted with the change from monastic to proprietorial church. The material probably ref reflects two strands of activity, the leisure time of the monks and lay brothers, and the teaching of board games, including to secular elite pupils. A parallel from Ireland may be the double-sided slate Nefertapel board from Downpatrick Cathedral in Northern Ireland, and also a, a similar board from Whittorn Priory. One other area of gaming practice shared between Pickland and Anglo-Saxon England, and again with Roman antecedents, is the use of knuckle bones or astragaly. These are a form of casting lot, a means of making a decision by leaving it to fate, possibly deriving from divination and soothsaying practice. Gambling on the outcome of cast lots is one of the earliest forms of gaming, and the three forms of lot casting, divinatory, decision making and gaming, share an impulse to determine the future which probably meant they were inextricably intertwined from the start. Like the parallel pipe dice we examined earlier, uh, knuckle bones are a form of a uh, quaternary lot, that is, where each face uh, has, uh, where, where each knuckle bone has four possible faces. The word comes from the Greek for knuckle bone, a straggly, uh, particularly those of sheep and goats. Their irregular shape means that on a hard surface, four outcomes are possible, and these are traditionally designated as flat, concave, convex, and sinuous, and associated with the numbers one, three, four, and six. The Romans called them uh, talus if they were actual uh, knuckle bones, and alia if they were artificial ones made of wood, metal, uh, and other materials. The Romans used the one, three, four, and six numbering in race and dice games, including 12 scripture. Knuckle bones have been found in early Anglo Saxon contexts, notably the 6th century cremation cemetery of Keister by Norwich where urn N59 held at least 36. 15 of them uh, were sheep and two roe deer, uh, and one of the deer ones uh, was uh, inscribed with runes. Found with them were 33 bone counters. Whilst the presence of knuckle bones suggests the possibility of magical divination through lock casting, it's perhaps more likely that the numbers involved meant they were being used as playing pieces. There are several examples of knuckle bones from sites in the Northern Isles. Perhaps the most notable is the three, uh, a magical number, again raising the prospect of divination, from the Brook of Burien, North Ronaldsea, in Orkney, where they were also found with three parallel pipe dice and three conical style gaming pieces. Like the Keister Astragali, two of the Burien knuckle bones are distinctively marked one with a crescent and V-rod on one broad face, and a disc with an indented rectangle on the other. The second has a confused looking design which is not adequately deciphered. Worth noting here is the recent recognition of a cattle phalange at Busan's Orkney, which also bears two incised figures, which uh, Lawrence suggests is more likely to be a gaming piece, possibly a form of skittle, drawing an analogy with Arthur McGregor's observation of the 20th century use of cattle phalanges in Friesland as skittle-like targets in a throwing game. 
Bearing in mind the Roman use of knuckle bones for controlling moves in 12 scripta or tabulae, it is of note that the Northern Isles distribution of, a, of knuckle bones is also echoed by the finds of decorated stone discs, the majority from the Shetlands. In their recent analysis of Pictish art, the Hendersons refer to these pieces in the context of Pictish symbol art on portable objects, suggesting that the discs may have been linked to lost metal discs. Certainly since their excavation, they have been suggested to be gaming pieces. From Jarlshof, we also have slate boards incised for Knefetapple and a Latrunculi-like la game. The discs do seem to have wider cultural linkages beyond uh, that suggested by the use of Pictish symbols. Number seven, for example, from uh, Stempster, uh, bears a spirally formed serpent with a beaded border, not unlike the much larger coiled serpent on the Meagle 26 recumbent slab, which along with those on Canal and Strathmartin II is probably a Christian resurrection symbol. It's also found on a 10th or 11th century wooden uh, disc from Dublin. Uh, number six, for example, from the Ness of Bergi, has a motive of a rectangle divided into nine compartments, which is echoed by the design on two knuckle bones from Borniche and South Uist, which the excavator suggests may have been uh, some form of notation, possibly recording the results of divination practice. Further divination was suggested at Borni Borniche by one of the dice being found inserted upright and unburned into the burnt layer of one of the destroyed houses. The interpretation being that an act of divination took place to determine whether the house should be rebuilt. It was. The discs are too large for any of uh, these boards, uh, but at five to seven centimeters in diameter and two centimeters thick, the, uh, they are large, but still suitable for, for backhand style tables game. This is perhaps to follow the suggestion of gaming pieces to its logical conclusion, and I would be the first to admit that the conclusion is unsatisfactory. The vast majority of known tablesmen are to varying degrees smaller than these discs. If tablesmen, they would be among the earliest dated examples from Europe, depending on where you place your cultural boundaries. Uh, we do have some early examples from uh, Roman Spain. Uh, they are then either uh, <coughs> tablesmen similar to these, but not identical, are found in Scotland as elsewhere, but they are generally dated to the 11th to 12th century and are poor, poorly provenanced antiquarian finds. There are several, there were several probably bone discs decorated with ring and dot and simple inter interlace from Queen Margaret's Inch, the Lock of Forfa in Angus. And a single bone tablesman was found at St. Mary's Chapel in St. Andrews in 1860, uh, among the long kiss of Hallow Hill. These are not as spectacular as the late 11th century Gloucester tabular set. Here we see uh, the pieces, six of the 30 pieces, and uh, a drawing of the board uh, from Gloucester. And alongside it, uh, a church capital showing a similar board from Toulouse. The Gloucester board, with what we might call its insular art inheritance, and the 11th century capital a carving from Toulouse, uh, shown with it in this slide, demonstrate that the medieval variant of tables was well established by the 11th century. Even if we retain the 11th century dating of the St. Andrews and the four far pieces, we can still see them as part of a European style of tablesman, visible in the archaeological record by the 9th century. Uh, <clears throat> leaving aside the, the, the earlier Roman examples. The earliest is a piece from Mikul Chise in Czechoslovakia, which bears a crouching archer on one side and a pair of fabulous reptiles on the other. The earliest ring and dot type appears to be an example from the Isle of Aumont in the northeast of France, which is 11th century. And it was found with two antler discs, one showing two fabulous beasts, and the other an equal armed cross, with expanded terminals set within a series of concentric circles. A 10th or 11th century example excavated in Dublin is carved in the late style which uh, Lang described as reflecting the West Viking animal ornament in the Irish Sea province, but that its image of a beast devouring a man is unique. Well, 
It is perhaps less unique if regarded as part of the inheritance from ancient art. Picture shark, for example, has a number of men being either swallowed or vomited from the mouth of the fabulous beast. The Dublin piece can be regarded as indicative of the social penetration of such art, though not necessarily to a universally accepted reception of its meaning. The only other early Scottish tablesmen known to me are the examples from the Lewis Gaming Hoard, also shown in this slide. They are the less well-known components of the Lewis Hoard, the chess pieces of which have an iconic status. An iconic status that is reflected, for example, in their inspiration for the animated uh, children's classic Nog in the Nog, uh, and in no small part deriving from the liveliness of their facial expressions. Remote seeming now, back in the medieval period, Lewis was well connected on that North Sea superhighway, with strong links to the rest of Scotland, to Ireland, and to the Scandinavian world. They arrived on Lewis by a boat, but not necessarily as a consequence of accidental <coughs> shipwreck, but just as likely, if not more so, as part of the travelling possessions of a powerful secular or ecclesiastical lord. Documentary evidence shows that Lewis was well used by such elites, and there is no overriding reason to believe they were not there for reasons other than that they were meant to be there. They probably journeyed there from Trondheim in Norway, currently seen as the most likely place of manufacture. Uh, Nidaros, or Trondheim Cathedral, has a range of cultural parallels for the gaming pieces and their decorative features, and their, including their costumes and weapons. Uh, and these include details of the 12th to early 13th century East End blind arcading in the cathedral, uh, a marble tombstone with a Lewis style pudding bowl helmet, and similar helmets on the St. Olaf altar frontal. All of this combined with details of the ecclesiastical costumes, the weapons, the presence of a similar chess piece from Trondheim, unfortunately now lost, and several other elements to suggest Trondheim as the workshop and a production date in the late 12th and early 13th century. Well, the finds of chess pieces are rare in Scotland, but they have a wide geographical spread. Here you see the three possibly early abstract pieces, which may be 12th century in date, but equally may be a little later. Abstract pieces uh, remain fashionable throughout the medieval period. Uh, later pieces of the 13th to 14th century comprise four, piece, four pieces, including this walrus ivory uh, king piece from Dunstaffinch Castle, recorded in the 18th century. And from the East Coast, uh, this abstract uh, jet uh, bishop from Neil Vennel in Perth. The chess pieces from Perth and Orkney are the only two from urban contexts in Scotland, and which we can set beside the bone piece, probably linked to Coldingham Priory, indicating a somewhat wider social spread than those from elite castle sites. Later pieces are much rarer finds. That the status of the game of chess was maintained, though, is indicated by the variety of text references. These include inventories, romance tales, and moral treatises, many of 16th century date. There are several other games popular in the later medieval period. The material excavated at the court site of Finlagen on Isla introduces us to the key elements. It includes a signal fragment of a graffito gaming board incised on a slate. Uh, its use as a gaming board presumably predates any use as a building slate, possibly having been scratched out to pass the time during or prior to construction work. It's probably a fragment from an Alkirk board. This is a war or leaping capture game widely played in Mediterranean and Asian cultures. Its name derived from an Arabic game introduced to Spain. Incised or graffiti Alkirk boards are comparatively rare in Britain, there are at least two other Scottish examples, again slate incised from uh, Dundonald Castle and from uh, the Lumbee Church in Angus. There may be a variant or, or incomplete example from Carrick Castle, which we'll see in a, in a very short while. Alkirk has parallels with the chase game of Fox and Geese, which was known as Todd and Lambs in Scotland. The Spanish variant of this, known as Catch the Hare, is recorded in an important manuscript of 1283 as being played on the Alkirk board. The Finlagen excavations also recovered three bone playing pieces, readily identifiable as tablesmen, used in a group of games derived from the Roman game of tabula and surviving today as backgammon. 
We have heard a little bit about tables already. It was popular throughout the medieval period from at least the 10th century onwards, as evidenced by the finds of pieces and boards. Uh, we've already mentioned the Gloucester one, but he's also uh, a, a misericord from Manchester Cathedral, which shows the game in a, 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 a public house context. Two smaller decorated Finlagen pieces were found together. Their contrasting zoomorphic and interlaced designs could represent opposing sides of the same set of pieces or elements from two separate sets distinguished by colour. From Scotland, we have a small tally of figurative bone gaming pieces. They include examples from Ion Abbey, the Bishop's Palace Kirkwall, Dalcross Castle, Stonehaven, Urquhart Castle and Melrose Abbey. The animals and monsters depicted include mermaids, rabbits, a grotesque, a horseman, a centaur and an eagle. From Rothsay Castle Butte comes a bone tablesman decorated with a floral motif within concentric circles comparable to wooden examples from Three and Perth. And uh, this is the Perth example on the right. Also of note for this discussion is a stone disc from Carrick Castle, Argyle, which is crudely decorated with the head of a queen. This could be imitating the more elaborate bone tablesman described above, though it's also possible that this represents an improvised queen piece for a low status chess set. <clears throat> note also top left, uh, the probable Alkirk board fragments. The larger Finlagen piece, which I don't have a slide of, has its upper surface incised with two concentric circles and a central compass point within a small circle. This simple decoration distinguishes it from the other two bone plane pieces and again is consistent uh, with a wider set of such pieces. These simpler forms of tablesmen come in a variety of materials, skeletal stone, reused pottery and wood, with a variety of ring and dot and or concentric circle decoration. Examples across these various media include the tables from the Lewis Hoard uh, and pieces from the Perth High Street, uh, and also examples from Urquhart Castle and from Aberdeen. They range in date from the 12th to the 15th century. Outside Scotland, the picture is similar, and a brief list could cite Golfo, uh, Lahore Castle, London, York and Trondheim. This slide also shows some of the cruder stone and pottery counters from Perth, which will have to suffice to illustrate other elements of the range of gaming pieces used. The larger Finlagen piece may, like the series of stone discs from the site, indicate gaming practice across all social levels. The Lord of the Isles and his court were, like their prize sets of chess and tables, peripatetic, and their occupation of Finlagen. Uh, unlike the poorer quality material culture of the permanent occupants who kept the site maintained and ticking over in readiness for the Lord's return. Tables and chess often went together. On the eve of the assassination of James I in 1437 in the Dominican Friary in Perth, accounts record how the court entertained itself, amongst other means, by playing chess and tables. Merrill's or Nyman's Morris was one of the most popular medieval board games. In terms of archaeological evidence, the boards most often survive, survive as graffiti inside designs on stone. In Scotland, there's a strong monastic distribution with boards known from Arbroath, Drybra and Jedburgh Abbeys, Bromwich Marnock and St Magnus Cathedral in Kirkwall. The game was played by Romans and Vikings, but the known British examples do not date with any certainty earlier than the 11th or 12th century. The accepted convention is that the game was a Norman introduction to mainland Britain. The Normans played the game, though, presumably because their Viking forebears did. The evidence for the game in pre-11th century Normandy, however, is very opaque. The picture I have painted tonight of the types of games, their kit and material and their social context has exposed only a small part of the evidence. Finds continue to be made, and just as importantly, there are assemblages overlooked in cursory excavation reports. So here's a very quick look at the equipment from Three Castle, excavated back in the 1970s, but with its gaming kit massively overlooked at the time and barely noticeable in the published report. We have a variety of evidence here, uh, notably a building slate incised with a, an Alkirk board. And I'm sure other board designs probably lie unrecognized on the site's slate assemblage. Shown on it here are a small wooden chess piece and a bone counter and strikingly similar material from, some, uh, from uh, a European castle, including uh, 
Heinlina in Finland. I mentioned three briefly earlier for its wooden counter with a floral motif. Uh, here it is alongside a smaller version in stone. Some of the range of other stone discs are also shown here along with a bone die. In order to bring things to a close, uh, it is to an aspect of dicing that I now turn. The medieval moral concern with the use of dice, a classic example of a cultural pursuit that attracted both praise and condemnation. These are some of the dice found in excavations on the Perth High Street. Games were the subject of legal attention because they were amenable to gambling and could also engender violence. Gambling was most readily associated with dice and was seen to lead to theft, brawling and murder. Gambling was perceived as an attack on sustenance and sociability, uh, on production, on commerce and on the family. These problems are neatly summarised in Chaucer's word picture of tavern life and gambling in the Pardon's Tale. He describes it as the very mother of lying, of deceit and cursed swearing, of blasphemy and manslaughter. The fight was still being fought by the Reformed Church. An entry for November 11, 1611, in the Kirk Session Register of St. John's Perth, records the account of an informer recounting a Sunday time spent gambling with dice and drinking in the house of Walter Young, who was a deacon of the Kirk. Uh, gambling also disturbed divine order through blasphemy, in some respects more worrying because it was a direct sin against God. Walter Bower's early 15th century Scotty Chronicon recounts how during the late 12th century siege of Chateaurieu by Philip of France, mercenaries were playing dice in front of the Church of the Blessed Virgin Mary. One of them, frustrated at losing his winnings, blasphemed and then broke an arm off a nearby statue of the Virgin. Blood was seen to pour from the arm and it was treated as a miraculous relic. Bauer notes, the wretched mercenary was that very day snatched away by the devil to that place to which he was already leading him and ended his life in a most miserable fashion. This uh, destination how is graphically indicated by Bruegel's triumph of death, which includes bottom right, cards, money, and a backgammon board all overturned in the face of the advancing army of death. It was painted around 1562, when gaming was still seen as an example of the general folly and wickedness of mankind, rather in the tradition of Hieronymus Bosch and his contemporaries from 100 years earlier, which also developed from earlier outlooks, as with the cardinal taken by death on this 15th century tarot card. Uh, and as an aside here, I should point out that although we have no cards surviving from medieval Scotland, they were certainly being played, uh, no doubt including tarot. James IV in particular appears to have been a profligate spender of money on playing at cards. Dice were frequently used as tools of divination and fortune telling, which itself was a root of gambling. They were used at the crucifixion to cast lots, to gamble for Christ's clothing, thus making them subject to fate inviting a double clerical condemnation. It also meant that dice were frequently depicted in a wide range of artistic media uh, as armor Christi or instruments of Christ's passion. A probably early 16th century bench end from the Cathedral of St. Magnus uh, Kirkwall uh, includes three dice in its depiction. A 15th century octagonal font in Meagol Parish Church shows them besides Christ's clothing. And in Norwich Cathedral, a 15th century nave roof boss shows three dice being cast for Christ's garments, with violence about to erupt. Many illuminated manuscripts and printed books also show the passion dice. For example, we have a mid 14th century ivory devotional book now in the VA Museum, uh, <coughs> and opposite that, a Chantry Chapel rare dos at Hexham Abbey. The dice are very small. I can't see them without my glasses on. I hope that you can. Often such depictions are in the context of the Mass of St. Gregory. Uh, and examples include Robert Campion's 1430 painting of the Mass on the left with dice on the cross arm and the 1539 feathers on panel depiction from Mexico uh, by the school of Peter of Ghent where the dice are depicted on the road. However, censure was not universal. Even divination was sometimes approved. 
St. Augustine, for example, thought that casting lots was a valid way to divine the will of God. There are several, several biblical precedents for the use of lots, and the Lex Frisionum indicates that in Frisia, lots were kept in a reliquary on the altar, one of them marked with a cross, and used to determine guilt or innocence. Innocence. The philosophers St. Thomas Aquinas and John of Salisbury both endorsed the recreational value of games. During the canonization inquiry into St. Thomas Cantalupe, who was a bishop of Hereford, his servant, Hugh LaBarber, testified that when he became blind, he prayed for recovery, hoping that he could at least see sufficiently again to see the host being raised, to move around, and to play at chess and dice. Clearly, if a miracle involving games could support the canonization of a venerable ecclesiastic, then the church had some tolerance for such pursuits. On the left in this slide, we see the 14th century Misericorde from Mont Benoit in France, possibly a reference to Dominican anti-gaming servants, but also indicative of the monastic pursuit of these games. The board shown is probably for chess. On the right, we see a double-sided board for chess and backgammon, uh, which by that time was known as Trick Track. It was made in around 1300, and since the 16th century has been in the treasury of the Church of St. Peter and Alexander in Aschaffenburg, deposited there by Cardinal Albrecht of Brandenburg when he fled west from the Reformation. It is probably the St. Rupert's gaming board listed in a relic list. It was also used as a reliquary, having on its edges glass compartments for keeping relics. This may not be an isolated instance of such a gaming uh, and Cult of Saints crossover. Here we see the 14th of uh, 15th century reliquary known as Charlemagne's chess set from the Collegiate Church of Santa Maria in Rosval uh, in Spain. The late 11th century chess pieces from South Italy for many centuries in the treasury of Saint Denis in Paris were similarly known as Charlemagne's chessmen, possibly because they were perceived as relics of Charlemagne. They had in fact nothing to do with it, that's not the point. It's a rather conventional stereotype to suggest that archaeologists find inspiration in beer. But without this uh, estimable bottle of ale from Brittany, I would not have this lead on a further link between saints and games. This time, St. Patton, whose chief cult centre was Barnes. One of his aides is clearly holding a chessboard. Uh, I'm still pursuing the details of this episode, but it chimes with the story of Raymond de Montpezat. Raymond was delivered from prison by Saint Foy, and in token of the miracle, he took a chessboard which was hanging on the wall of his dungeon and gave it to the shrine of Saint Foy in Caen. It may be that the series of lead badges from the Netherlands depicting gaming boards, and which I previously interpreted as an indication of the social spread of the game, uh, counter to the late medieval satire of chess being the game of church and aristocratic elites, have something to do with pilgrimage after all. This apparent contradiction between seeing gaming as both evil and good should occasion no surprise, being yet another everyday manifestation of the thread or paradox of binary oppositions that runs through medieval culture. Uh, finally, I hope that this discussion has demonstrated the value of playing the game of chasing down the wider social relevance and context of board and dice games. I hope that you will also agree that this has been done in the light of the fundamental relevance of the material in demonstrating the human propensity for play. That subtle combination of recreation and recreation, escaping the world and refashioning it to our liking. It is about being and becoming. Thank you very much.